All right, it looks like we can go ahead and get started. Hello again, my name is Kira Sobers and I'm the Media Digitization Manager at the Smithsonian Institution Archives, part of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, where we collect, preserve, and share the history of the Smithsonian Institution. On behalf of the archives, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program and the penultimate installation of the Smithsonian 175th Film Fest, films from the Smithsonian Institution Archives. Before we get started, I want to gratefully acknowledge the Piscataway people on whose ancestral homelands I live and work, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here. I encourage everyone to learn more about the historic and current Native communities in the area that you call home through your local museums and centers, as well as the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. And now for a few details about how this will all work. The chat box is where we'll be communicating with you throughout the program and where we'll post links as they come up in the discussion. If you're having technical problems, please send a private chat to either myself, Kira Sobers, or Emily Neckrish, my co-coordinator today, and we will try to help you out. If you have any questions throughout the program, we encourage you to put them in the Q&A box and we will answer them towards the end. We hope to see you next month for the final installment in our year-long film fest on August 26th from 12 to 1 p.m. We'll be joined by Mignon Davis and Archives Digital Archivist Linda schmitz -Fierig. They'll take us back to the Smithsonian's 150th birthday party and provide some background to the film. Additionally, Linda will share about how the film arrived at the archives and her work as a digital archivist. For today's presentation, we will be screening a film from the 1989 exhibition, Yanni, the Brush of Innocence. Following the film screening, Alan Francisco, one of the National Museum of Asian Arts exhibition managers, will provide a glimpse into just how much work and how many people it takes to create an exhibition like Yanni. From obtaining loans from around the world to the often complex considerations involved in transforming empty galleries into a vibrant display space. And then he'll be answering questions from the audience. A little bit of background about Alan. Alan Francisco is the Senior Registrar for Loans and Exhibitions at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. He oversees the incoming and outgoing loan programs and helps guide the development and implementation of exhibitions. He previously served as the Head Registrar at the National Museum of Women in the Arts here in Washington, DC, and for the Department of Anthropology at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. Enjoy the film. Wang Yani was only four years old when I first shot a film about her, a child painter of Li Jiang. Now she is 11. Yani was born into a family of the Zhuang nationality in Guangxi's Gongcheng County. Her family lives in this small lane. Yani named her younger brother Xiang Yu, which means luck and soaring. Her father, Wang Shiqiang, is a noted oil painter in the locality. Her mother is called Tang Feng Jiao. Yani learned to do household chores from her mother when she was a child. Her favorite is to make oil tea of the Zhuang style. Her father has tried every means to cultivate her disposition to be a bold, bright, and cheerful one.
One day, when she was at the age of two, Yani was reluctant to leave the park when she saw monkeys there. Then her father bought her a monkey, and she and the monkey became friends. of a monkey friend when she took up a pencil for the first time. The painting of a drunken monkey she drew when she was four won a prize at the Asian Children's Painting Exhibition held in Singapore. Yani was happy. So was her father and the monkey. Yani is so engrossed in drawing monkeys that she can draw for several hours and paint many monkeys without a break. From the age of six till now, Yani has published three albums of paintings. Yani painted the picture Joyful Gathering when she was six. The painting Tuck of War Cheer. The painting, Little Monkey Gets Sick After Eating Rotten Fruit. In Rattan Climbing Contest, Yani painted the innocence of children. Yani regards the monkey as man. Yani is the youngest STEM designer in China. The Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications issued a commemorative stamp, scratching an itch for mother, painted by Yani when she was four. When she was nine, Yani could paint impromptu. The painting, We Have Dinner Here, has unique composition and rich imagination. Yani is the youngest Chinese painter to host art exhibitions. Since she was 10 years old, she has held eight exhibitions of her paintings in Japan and Federal Germany. Now Yani has two monkey friends, but in her mind, there are numerous monkey friends. Monkey has always been her favorite of painting. The monkeys in her paintings present her ideal joyful scenes on earth.
Yani was a gentle disposition, has many little friends. She never quarrels with others. Yani is a fourth grade student at the Chengxiang Primary School. The teacher praised her for her studying hard and being a good pupil. She and her father often have a walk and sketch from nature in open country. Yani loves these giant pines. She could perceive many beautiful images from the box. She loves to play the clock dolls and often tells her thinking to these little friends from Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Japan and Federal Germany. Once I found that Yani was painting on her father's oil painting paper. Exceptionally happy to join her father in painting. She took up a brush to doodle and dub the flower painted by her father. Her father remarked with a kind and pleasant countenance. Yani, you should respect the partner with whom you want to draw a picture. You shouldn't damage the other's works by showing off your ability. What you did is not called painting jointly, but correcting others' painting. Her father was painting flowers, while Yani 
wanted to paint a cock and a hen with two chicks on the back. Its title is A Story Among Flowers. Yanni told me that she, like the chicks she painted, lives in the midst of flowers under the tender care of her parents. It's the first time for me to see her tossing the brush to paint. guides her in painting, never makes indiscreet remarks, and lets her paint freely, willingly, and cheerfully. done within an hour. The red cormorants seem to be bathing in the rays of morning sun. The father took the daughter to visit an art exhibition of painter Dong Xinbin from Jiangsu province. Wu Chun Dao, an associate professor of the Guangxi Teachers University and a calligrapher, says, you have beautiful monkeys in your mind when you paint monkeys. It is the same when you write the word happiness. Li Luo Gong, a calligrapher and seed cutter, after seeing Yanni's painting, a dove and a tiger painted together, called People Want Peace, praised her for a unique composition and meaningful skills.
Yanni has painted more than 10,000 paintings in eight years. The success in art results from diligence. From the age of four till now, Yanni has hosted 17 exhibitions of her paintings at home and abroad. The Lion Awakes. The Flower Fairy Maiden comes here. Pick up the fruit and bring it home. The subjects of Gianni's paintings have been expanded, the contents enriched, and her skills improved. I hope my little friend Wang Yanni continues her efforts and will become a master painter in the future. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the film. Uh, it's just, uh, I've seen it several times and it's uh, just extraordinary. Uh, what an incredible talent. Um, oh, pardon me, I just realized I'm not at the beginning. Um, uh, what an extraordinary talent Yanni uh, is and, um, and really what an interesting, uh, choice for an exhibition at um, uh, the museum here in 1989. I regret that um, I joined the museum uh, a full 10 years later, so I was not around for that project. And so I am not going to talk uh, at all about that show in particular, but I do want to talk to you about what would go into exhibitions of that kind and others that we do at the National Museum of Asian Art. Uh, and honestly, the title is a bit of a uh, is a bit misleading because, in some in many respects, there's nothing particularly unusual about uh, what we do at our museum. All major museums organize exhibitions along um, many of the same lines, regardless of what the uh, what the subject matter is. Um, so let me first um, start uh, by. Uh, saying that, uh, as as Kira so nicely introduced me at uh, at the beginning, uh, that I am Alan Francisco. I'm uh, uh, an exhibitions and collections specialist at the National Museum of Asian Art, and you'll see on the screen there that the the rather arcane title of senior registrar. And um, as we go through the presentation, I'll I'll tell you a little bit ab about that role because. Um, this is really about uh, the behind the scenes, and I am about as behind the scenes with exhibitions as, as you can possibly get. Um, so the first thing I want to do is introduce you, if you are not already familiar with us, to the National Museum of, uh, of Asian Art. Um, the building that you see 
On the left is the Freer Gallery of Art, which opened uh, to the public in 1923. So we will be uh, celebrating our centennial next year. There'll be a lot of um, interesting programs uh, and exhibitions done in association with the centennial that really look back at our first hundred years and look forward to what we uh, are planning to do in the future. Um, so I hope you will uh, keep an eye out uh, for, for those programs launching next year. Uh, the building on the right is uh, the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, uh, which opened in 1987. Uh, so these two, these two buildings and their respective collections uh, collectively um, form uh, the, the National Museum of Asian Art. What do we have? Um, I think when we talk about exhibitions, we're talking about our collecting focus. And, um, and what you see here are collections that span uh, the Islamic world all the way to Japan. Uh, so um, uh, ancient, uh, ancient Egyptian uh, uh, objects and uh, Islamic and um, the ancient world across the, uh, the Near and Middle East, um, we have a great collection of uh, manuscripts and art of the book from uh, from uh, the the uh, from Iran and and, and elsewhere. Um, we have Indian uh, and South Asian art uh, again, paintings and and as well as as well as objects, uh, the arts of the uh, Himalayan region and uh, as well as from Southeast Asia. We have art from China and Japan and Korea. And what I'm doing in showing you these slides is not just the, the geographical breadth, but I hope a little bit of the diversity of the types of objects that, uh, that we have in our collections in which we exhibit. And that diversity is something that we'll talk about when we actually, uh, when, I, when I show you a little bit about um, how exhibitions come together and some of the challenges and, uh, and opportunities uh, in putting together exhibitions. And then um, maybe not finally, because this is really a quick encapsulation, we have contemporary uh, art and we have uh, a highly significant archival collection, uh, which we uh, make use of, not just in terms of research, which is critically important, but also in helping to, um, to bring context to the artwork that, that we display. And then finally, um, we have in, in the Freer Gallery, um, we have American art of the late 19th century, uh, perhaps epitomized most by, in, in what is our most famous, arguably famous work in, in our collections, uh, Harmony in, in Blue and, uh, and Gold, the, the Peacock Room by James McNeil Whistler, which you see here. And this entire, uh, this entire space is a collection, a single collection object. All the individual ceramics that you see there are separate objects in the collection, but the room itself is a collection object um, uh, alone. So what I'd like to do now, and, uh, and we'll have lots of time for, uh, for questions and answers at the end. And I, so I hope that this presentation will give you some thoughts about questions you might um, ask. And, and you may have others that uh, that I'm not covering, but one of the the way that I wanted to approach this because I can't really tell you in 15 minutes uh, in any detail, and I don't think it would be terribly interesting to be honest. The the real nuts and bolts of developing exhibitions, a lot of it is actually quite mundane. It's a lot of meetings and and um, and phone calls and emails, uh, like many professions. But I wanted to uh, I want to highlight for you some things that you might not consider. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you watching are people who have, are avid museum goers and you've been to lots of exhibitions. And um, I, I'm curious to know, and I hope, I hope people will share in the chat, um, how much they, these, I, these notions have occurred to them or, or if they're brand new. If, if anyone has stopped to think, how long does it take to develop exhibitions? And uh, I suspect that for most people, it's longer than you might think. Um, and it really depends on the size of an exhibition and whether you are borrowing uh, artwork uh, from other collections, how far away, um, how, um, how delicate or fragile or 
uh, the objects might be lots of different considerations, or whether you're just exhibiting works from your collection in one small gallery. So on the upper end, I would say that exhibitions can take a decade or more. And uh, now that does not mean that um, uh, there's a large group of people who are actively working for a decade on the development of exhibitions. That's relatively, uh, uh, it's extremely rare. But what I mean is from the moment that a curator, and we'll talk about the different roles a little bit in a moment, but really it's a curator beginning with an idea, beginning with a story that they want to tell. That's the that's the seed of, of every exhibition. Um, they need to come up with that idea. They need to research it. They might need to travel. Almost invariably, they need to travel and see other collections or go to libraries and archives. Uh, they need to reach out to other uh, scholars, uh, uh, colleagues that uh, have similar interests. So this takes a long time to even flesh out the notion of what one might do. And the larger the exhibition and the more you're trying to bring elements together from around the world, the longer that process takes. So there's that, that development period, the, the, uh, the, the time to develop the, the thesis of a story. But then eventually at some point, it needs to move beyond the, 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 the curatorial um, uh, the, the, the curatorial vision and be shared with a larger group of people to really start developing it and, and giving scope to the project. That's really where I get involved and where most people uh, uh, that, that work on exhibitions start to get involved. And at that point, it could be anywhere uh, up to five years sometimes more under rare circumstances, but for really big sh shows, you could work on them for as many as, as five years. Um, that's a little rarer. I would say two to three years is um, more common. That's still a long time. I, I don't know that people really think, and that's just one show that you're doing. So all of us have multiple projects that are in motion at the same time, and they're all staggered on different, on different timelines. I'm going to stop here every once in a while and just be mindful of my time because I don't want to talk too long. Um, who's involved in making exhibitions? That's another one where I think people would be really surprised at how many different roles in, in, are, are involved uh, directly, tangentially. And I say tangential, but they're still critical to making certain elements happen. So if you stop and think uh, to yourselves, who do you know um, th that are involved or what, what positions do you know? You think of curators. We've already talked about that. I think that's the um, and I, I I put them in the center for a reason. Um, most people are familiar with security guards. They're the ones as you're walking through that say, "Don't touch that" or frown when you trip off one of those annoying audible alarms. Um, they're they're that real front of house um, staff that that visitors encounter, and docents and volunteers as well. I mean, these folks are generally unpaid. Um, they love the mission of the museum and they volunteer their time to help contextualize exhibitions and make the, the, the museum accessible uh, to, the, to the public. Absolutely crucial role. But then there are all of these roles. Uh, and I know that I'm missing things. Uh, I li literally dashed off a, a list um, a week or two ago, and uh, added some over time as I as I thought of them. But I know that I'm missing ones because I'm thinking about it from my context. Uh, so I'll give you just a second to kind of, and you don't need to read all of these. We're not going to discuss all of these, but I want to give you a sense of just the sheer scale. I mean, look at some of these um, uh, positions we have, and, and I have to even try to find them on my own um, slide here, but we have like development and fundraising, right? We need, oop, pardon me, we need people who uh, can raise money for exhibitions. These are expensive undertakings. Uh, we have uh, facilities managers on the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm sure no one thinks about the fact that you know, buildings, these buildings need to be cleaned and maintained. Uh, the, the galleries need to be kept uh, clean. Uh, we need 
all of our facilities to be uh, working properly, the environmental systems and, and uh, electrical systems and all of those things. So facility managers are absolutely involved uh, in, in exhibitions. Um, and then there's the term that I think, I mean, if you look around this screen, you can probably guess at a lot of the roles. And the, the one that might be among the more arcane is mine, um, registrars. A museum registrar is, um, it, and it takes its word from the same uh, role as university registrars, or um, you know, sometimes the term is used in uh, in government contexts for people who are logging things, right? People who are recording things, and that's exactly what we do. We record collections objects, and we um, and we record um, loans that are coming into the building. It's much more than that. It's it's really about executing the legal agreements um, uh, and maintaining those files. Do we how how do we prove that we own objects or that we're entitled to be borrowing from someone? Insurance and all the risks ma risk management issues, uh, ensuring that these works of art are properly uh, stored and accounted for and tracked. Uh, and then and there are different subspecialties of registrars. My role is primarily with loans and exhibitions and really focusing on exhibitions. So I am most of the time working on uh, individual projects and uh, making sure that our objects that are selected from our collections um, are uh, able to be exhibited and help to coordinate uh, what is a uh, really complicated process of connections among staff members, curators and conservators and uh, design specialists and fabricators, um, lighting specialists, uh, editors, because we uh, we have text that we put on walls. And, and we'll talk about some of those when I get to some real more interesting uh, slides than than this one. Uh, so in a in a very broad nutshell, that is uh, registrars work very closely and have a lot of overlap with project managers uh, within our specific function, which is centered primarily around the uh, the art artwork. Uh, we are making sure that all of the human connections are being made uh, to do what we what we need to do. So then, how do we put exhibitions together? We've got timelines, and we have all of these people. Um, how, how do we actually? Put the shows together, um, and I'm sorry. This is I know this is a very glib uh, response, but yeah, very carefully in in the sense that it's very thoughtful. Uh, we spend a lot of time agon agonizing over a lot of details that, in the end, are probably not going to be noticeable to the general public. Then why do we do it? Well, we do it because we uh, if we don't do it. When you when when something doesn't work well, you notice it. It's sort of like in theater. If if the curtain doesn't go up uh, correctly, you notice it. Um, so, and I just realized that I'm already talking longer than I um, plan to. So, I just want to show you these slides of, of of gallery installations and get you thinking about some of the roles um, that were involved in producing this. We had art handlers and conservators uh, who were absolutely uh, essential to the uh, installation of the artwork. We had case fabricators. We had uh, editors and um, and designers uh, to design the label text and the wall chat. Uh, we have lighting specialists. All of the lighting is um, done specific to every exhibition. All those lights come down at the end and uh, bulbs get replaced and uh, new, new designs go up to create a different mood for every exhibition. We have technology components wasn't as true 40 years ago, or uh, certainly um, during the um, era of Yanni, they probably would have had that film screening in a, in a room. But in terms of technology components, there really weren't any. Now it's really essential. And this exhibition, this is uh, the, a show that uh, uh, closed uh, uh, during the pandemic, res uh, Resound. It was up for a number of years um, um, at the museum sound components were absolutely essential and and uh and and these digital elements to take these ancient chinese bronzes and uh and give you a sense of of uh the power of the sound they could produce because these are now museum objects and we don't strike them um 
this is encountering the Buddha. And the, the, the thing I wanted to point out here are um, the, is that we learn from the public. The public is absolutely involved in exhibitions. We installed this exhibition with a certain flow that began in our lobby and ended in a corridor to our um, to our gift shop. And then we did audience testing midway through uh, because we wanted to test out how things were working. And we discovered to our surprise that actually most people come to this gallery from the other side. We had sort of installed it in the in the in the wrong order, and so we're constantly learning and we're constantly trying to figure out how to improve uh, the exhibitions that that we do. Um, really large objects that need complex rigging, and uh, like these colossal stone sculptures. And I'm going to show you a whole bunch of other things in that vein. This was a contemporary work of our a, a uh, late 19th century uh, Japanese fishing boat, 40 feet long. Um, that was uh, found by the artist Sai Guo Chang, and he wanted to use it for to tell a contemporary um, story. Uh, had it dismantled, shipped by uh, uh, ocean uh, uh, freight by boat um, uh, to the U.S. It came all the way across country by train on shipping containers, delivered to the museum. And then there's these are Chinese uh, export ceramics, uh, inexpensive white porcelain ceramics piled all around it. I don't have time to go into the significance of the artwork. What I want to show you is um, this is in the uh, ground level pavilion for the Sackler. There's, you're not, this, this isn't just going to magically appear here. What had to happen is in the middle of the night, um, a crane blocked two levels of uh, two lanes of Independence Avenue uh, outside the museum. And a, the each section of the boat was lifted over the rooftop, you can just see it's a blurry shot, but you can see this section here flying over the museum. Here's a better shot. And drop down into the garden and brought through uh, a doorway into, uh, into the space by uh, uh, specialists and, uh, and uh, the artist's team. And then over the span of, if I remember correctly, it's been quite a while, Two weeks um, uh, to uh, solder it together and uh, and and bolt everything together. Um, and let me just go back and just say that. Uh, and then ceramics were piled all around it uh, and, and smashed and broken in the process. Quite an undertaking. And I'm going to end on the on the note that um, our next big exhibition that has been truly five years plus in the making is A Splendid Land, paintings from Royal Udaipur. Um, this is a uh, major loan exhibition, uh, works coming from India, Australia, Switzerland, uh, the UK, as well as uh, multiple uh, uh, lenders in the United States, uh, opening November 19th and then uh, traveling to the Cleveland Museum of Art next summer. So all of the things that I just did a whirlwind uh, 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 bolt through, uh, all of those uh, have been very much in play for the development of this exhibition and we're looking forward to launching it. Um, my goodness, the time goes by quickly. I hope people have questions. And I thank you very much for joining us today. I thank uh, Smithsonian um, uh, Archives for the opportunity uh, and for my colleagues at the National Museum of Asian Art for helping me put together this, this presentation. Thank you so much, Alan. That was fascinating. Um, I love every single one of these programs we do. I always learn so much about what our awesome colleagues are doing around the institution. Uh, one of the questions that we had come in from the audience is, among all of the people involved, who's responsible for the physical placement of items within the exhibits and the flow of the crowds, et cetera? Like you're mentioning that um, example about the Buddha exhibit. Yeah, so um, there are very few, there are very, very few things that get done by just one person. There's, there, there's, it's always a collaboration. So in terms of who decides on object placements, it's generally um, the curator working with the designer. Um, at our museum, we have division of specialties between 3D designers and 2D designers. So people who are doing layouts are the 3D designers. So they're having a conversation about how best to display a particular work. But then you have to consult conservators uh, to make sure that the actual placement is going to be safe for the object. Um, and then in terms of the overall layout, does it make sense? 
you want visitor service spe um, specialists, people who kind of know what our public, uh, you know, is the, is the story that we're telling, are people navigating through the, um, the space correctly? That's where educators and visitor service people can be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, another question that came in, are all of the exhibit cases built on site? Uh, sometimes, not always. So th that's the short answer is we do, every museum is a little bit different. Um, at our museum, we're still very fortunate to have a cabinet shop. And so our team fabricates uh, casework, not the not the acrylic, uh, not the, the, the plexiglass uh, vitrines. Those are always done by contractors, but we do a lot of our fabrication. But I, the other thing I should mention is that everything that we do in-house can also be done by contractors. So sometimes if you have a really ambitious uh, program and your staff is stretched thin, uh, you hire people on the outside to, to work with you to do that work. Um, you mentioned risk management issues. What kind of risks does your team consider when putting together an exhibition? All kinds of, I mean, it runs the gamut. So on, at the starting from the, the basic premise, right? If you're borrowing a work of art, these are, we call them priceless, but there, there is a dollar uh, valuation put on everything. So they need to be insured. Uh, the, you never wanna use your insurance. When you have something that truly is irreplaceable, the whole, our, and this is actually a key function of my position, is to assemble the, the team of, of specialists that look at how is something gonna be packed? How is it going to be shipped? How are we handling it? How is it going to be mounted? Does it need a case, uh, you know, a vitrine on top of it, or can it be exposed? What kind of light levels are appropriate? You can actually control the humidity of a case if you are, if, if your ambient conditions are too dry or too humid for for particular works of art. All all of that are are risk management strategies. Um, we've had to deal with. Um, working with a country on an exhibition in the uh, in the middle of uh, a thwarted coup attempt. So then you start doing uh, risk management about like, can we continue to engage with that government when we're not sure that government is going to be in place? Those are those are the kinds, of, that's the gamut right there. I think that leads really well into the next question, uh, which is with all of the moving parts, like working with foreign governments, how far into the process of planning an exhibition does it get announced to the public? That varies. I mean, it, 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 certainly if, if you're talking about exhibitions where there are you know, foreign government, um, uh, it, it, it kind of depends on how soon you've inked, inked the agreements with, with, those, um, with those entities. And that really depends on a lot of circumstances. I will say working working with Asia means that sometimes things come down to the wire a little bit, but you also have situations where there are sort of gentlemen's agreements. So you, um, so you don't have the ink signed on the actual contract, but both parties are really interested in promoting the exhibition. So um, I would say, you know, when you start to get six months out for a large exhibition, your public affairs folks are really chomping at the bit to 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 start to do the lead advertising, right? So Sorry. at that point, that's a, that's what we're shooting for at the very least. Uh, along the same vein, do you have an example of an exhibit which you worked on but ultimately fell through for whatever unfortunate reason? Uh, we have had. But nothing that had been, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, nothing that had been announced with the exception, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure it had already been announced. We had an exhibition due to organize in, uh, due to open, I'm sorry, it was three quarters of the way installed when the pandemic hit in March of 2020. And the exhibition was called Meeting Tessai. And um, we debated, we kept it in the galleries dark with, with uh, they, these were light sensitive works and we, we even covered them over because we didn't know, of course, in March, 2020, how long this was going to go on for. And so we kept it up for quite a while. And then it became clear that there were other commitments. There were other projects that were coming that we, that we just couldn't, uh, we couldn't accommodate the show. And so it, it, it all came back down and, uh, and that was really unfortunate. But there were a lot of projects that I wouldn't say a lot. That's not a, I think it depends on the institution. For us, it's relatively few that don't see their way to, to fruition. But many, 
can can end in an early stage. It's simply that we don't have the resources, or it's too complicated, or the it's a there was a lender and and their circumstances changed. It's, it's usually pretty early in the process. Okay. Um, how do exhibition planners deal with the restrictions on the use of freer owned items? Um, and if you can talk a little bit about the restrictions on the sure, yeah, that's that's a, don't know. that's a that is a question from a knowledgeable from a knowledgeable <laughs> individual for sure. So the Freer Gallery of Art, uh, as I mentioned, opened in 1923, and um, it, in an era in which those kinds of unusual stipulations were more common, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and the Barnes Foundation, and you know there the, there was this. It was not unusual for for. Uh, for founders to to basically put strange stipulations in place. Um, Charles Lang Freer stipulated that nothing could be borrow, borrowed or lent um, uh, from the Freer collection or brought into the Freer collection for like temporary exhibition purposes. The, 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 the collection was static in that sense and had to be displayed in that in that building. Consequently, some of the most significant works of art um, from across Asia, really iconic um, pieces in their home countries cannot travel to to those countries for exhibition, and what has happened is with the addition of the um, Sackler Gallery, and, and not immediately in 1987, but many years later, um, the determination was made that because the two buildings are physically linked, uh, an argument can be made that the Sackler is an adjunct of of the Freer, that these are this is a contiguous space. Um, we don't want to overstep that. So what we have done is, um, on occasion, judiciously, we will bring Freer Gallery um, works into the Sackler for temporary exhibitions. Um, there are lots of rules behind it that I won't go into, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's a it's a it's a bit of a tightrope walk. But it's inconceivable in the tw uh, 21st century to not have the opportunity to try to um, to put kindred works of art together in conversation with each other. And I will say that's what's made much of the Sacklers exhibition program so robust is that there are lenders around the world who absolutely want to send their works to us for display, knowing that they're going to be displayed in association with freer works in, in the only place where that can take place. Yeah, I'm sure that a hundred years ago, Freer didn't imagine that this would be something that that would want to, the people would want to happen that, you know, absolutely relate these collections together. So it's, it's nice that there's that method of doing so while still feel you know, like following the spirit of what he asked for. Yeah. Being able to show all these things in context together is amazing. Um, Another question that we got was with the Smithsonian now much more committed to returning artifacts to countries of origins. How does that affect exhibitions, for example, if relevant works from institution from another institution are in dispute? So mm -hmm. not within the Freer collection, but other works that you're trying to get a hold of. Well, you know, I think unquestionably there's more, and this is this is really a question that's more for my curatorial colleagues than than for me directly. That I could, I I can't give you a nuanced answer. I can tell you, it's certainly made. Um, the work harder of vetting the, the works that you uh, want to borrow for for exhibition. To be clear, I mean I, there, a certain amount of of um, of research does need to be done. Even even yes, things have ramped up, but for decades there have been issues around, say, World War II provenance and and things of that nature. So uh, it's I think it's absolutely the case that no prudent museum would. Um, borrow a work of art where there is a known, like, like a publicly known, um, contested, you know, situation. Um, right. You'll you'll notice. I mean, granted, they're really large; they're in a big permanent space. But you notice the British Museum isn't isn't sending the the, uh, the Parthenon marbles all over all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Agree. Um, okay. Last question. Hopefully 
it should be a little easier. Do you have any favorite projects from your time with the National Museum of Asian Art? Any favorite exhibits you've worked on? I have, I have, I have a number. I don't have one single, and I'm not just saying that because um, multiple colleagues of mine could be on the uh, could could be uh, watching and, and accuse me. <laughs> um, yeah, um, one that unfortunately I just I didn't have good photography to show. Probably one of the earliest ones from my from my uh, time was um, Isamu Noguchi and modern Japanese ceramics, which was uh, from 2003. Uh, Isamu Noguchi is well known uh, as an American uh, sort of designer and landscape architect. Um, but he also made three trips to Japan um, and worked in, in ceramics, which is not a mode that he's known for. And so our curator of ceramics at the time put together this magnificent exhibition, 30 lenders, 20 of them from Japan. And I had the the good fortune of being able to travel with her and with our exhibition conservator to collect them uh, and and return them. And it was just a uh, it was just fascinating in, in so many ways. And also a uh, brilliant design. These were not these were not like really super impressive, powerful objects. And so what made that exhibition was this incredible combination of like curatorial brilliance and design brilliance. Our designer did a it was just a beautiful show. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and for giving all of this awesome information. I will probably never look at, at a museum exhibit the same way again, um, in a good way. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. And please make sure that you um, attend our final screening of the series next month. Have a great afternoon, everyone.